Okay, Kendra, it looks like we've got a pretty good group on. Um, did you want to run through any any you know, housekeeping or other other general items uh, related to uh, you know, mute and camera usage and all of that before we get started? Yeah, I think um, everyone should be automatically muted when they come in. So we'll just stay on mute um, through presentations. And then if folks have questions and they can ask them in the chat window um, and then we'll, uh, we'll help moderate asking those questions as we go along. Um, and videos, if you have video, it's always great to have it on just to see friendly faces since we don't get to do that in person anymore. Great. Th thanks, Kendra. You know, I know we've got a, a, a really great, we've got a great agenda. Wanted to thank everyone for, for joining us for our annual meeting. This is the first time, at least that I'm aware, that we've uh, had our annual meeting conducted as a web meeting. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, typically we've done these in person and they've been attached to another event. Having this as a web meeting allows us to have participation across the state, and hopefully, we set a record for the number of participants we have in the web meeting. So, it should, should be a really good discussion. We have we've put a lot of thought into structuring this, so it's a you know both a good report out on on our year's activities and a, a launching point for for next year's activities. So, again, thanks, you know, big thanks to everyone for uh, for joining and participating. Um, I think I'll go ahead and. Uh, get started. Um, you know, we'll start with that. Uh, we'll start with that year in review, uh, or I'll, I'll give a, a summary of what we've done over the last year and as an organization. Uh, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to our our uh, new president for 2021, Kendra Kaiser, who will lead a, a round robin discussion with a number of leaders in the water resources uh, industry in the state. Uh, we'll have uh, we'll have a round. Ron Robin presentations and then opportunities for breakout discussion with them and reporting back. So uh, real quickly about uh, AWRA, the American Water Resources Association. The AWRA is dedicated to the advancement of water resource or water resources management, research and education. Our members represent a community of water professionals with diverse backgrounds. They share an engage, engage, engagement in solving some of the toughest water resources challenges. And in the Idaho section, we, we strive to put that mission uh, into action here in the state of Idaho. Our officers for the year, again, my name is Mike Schubert. I'm a water resources engineer with HDR Engineering. And I've been the president of, of the Idaho section of AWRA in 2020. Uh, Kendra Kaiser uh, with Boise State University is our president-elect. Uh, Katie Carberry at uh, DEQ is our vice president, our uh, secretary, treasurer, and uh, you know generally the one who, who keeps all the plates spinning for us uh, for the last several years is uh, Kathy Peter, and then our immediate past president, who's also an officer and, and you know to maintain continuity, is Andy Weigel with Idaho Materials. Set, starting out the year, we set some goals for the organization in 2020. Uh, you know, it, uh, we had a, a meeting where we, we talked about what we wanted to accomplish in the year, and, and we identified six main goals. The first was to continue our lunch and learn series. That's been that's become a real hallmark of our organization. So we want to want to continue that that series. Uh, second goal is to continue or keep improving our website. We've, we've made strides in our website and wanted to continue to make that a, a great information hub uh, for all things water resources uh, uh, in the state. Uh, third uh, was to address our member feedback. We had a, we uh, conducted a member survey in 2019. We got some feedback and we wanted to you know, evaluate that, that feedback and, and address you know, really what our membership is looking for out of uh, involvement in AWRA. Fourth, to increase our the awareness of AWRA and our membership, uh, specifically uh, with an eye to increasing awareness and membership across the state, uh, you know, in, and uh, you know beyond just the Treasure Valley. Uh, fifth, uh, increase our student and university involvement, and we'll talk about the ways that we've done that. And then, lastly, 
uh, and, and really an aspiration for this group is to become a, a real forum for discussing, you know, Idaho water resources challenges. Uh, you know, I won't, I won't, uh, I won't go to the website right now, but I'll show everyone the uh, address for our website, and you can you can check it out. We've we've put a lot of work into the website this year. Uh, our website uh, now includes an Idaho water resources events calendar that includes not just our events, but events from a number of of cooperating uh, water resources organizations throughout the state. Uh, the website also includes recordings of our, uh, our webinar series and uh, our Meet the Professional series, which we'll talk about, uh, which we'll talk about a little later as well. So our, our website, we're, we're putting a lot of work into uh, producing digital content, and making that available to our membership. Uh, I, I mentioned our member survey. Uh, at the end of 2019, we took a we had a, our, we conducted a member survey. And one of the questions we asked was, what are, what are what are two things that people would like more of at AWRA events? And, and the two the two main uh, the two main items that rose to the top uh, were, were like to see more technical presentations and more structured discussion out of this group. And you know, so with that in mind, uh, events like this meeting and uh, some of the other uh, events that we have. That we have, we've had this year and, and are planning next year are really focused towards uh, helping bring technical content and structured discussion to our membership. Uh, this is a, a, a summary of our events in 2020. I won't I won't go through all of these events. What I will mention is that you know there's a there's a combination of events that, that were uh, in person webinars before uh, before March. Uh, before March and uh, came and, and COVID-19 uh, threw us a curveball. Um, following, uh, you know, following March, we made a shift to uh, doing our Lunch and Learn series as a webinar, and that's been really successful. We've had uh, uh, we've had a number of webinars, uh, both in cooperation with other organizations, um, including uh, including uh, the Idaho Technical Committee of NORFMA and the Boise River Enhancement Network. Uh, we've also had our, our first uh, student presentation. Anna Spiro with Boise State University presented uh, her work, her research work, uh, modeling the Teton dam failure consequences using a uh, geoclock code. Uh, we hosted a virtual happy hour uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and you know, the, the latest event is this annual meeting. So we, we've, uh, we've made the shift uh, in the middle of 2020, from in-person uh, in-person events to uh, to virtual events, uh, and then we've also, as I mentioned before, uh, we've we've put a, a new emphasis on our Meet the Professional series interviews. This is something that our organization used to do in person, and and have now uh, gone to uh, recording interviews that both have both a video and audio component. So if uh, you know, a couple couple things, we've we've had four of these interviews. The recordings of these interviews are, are on our website. They're about 15, 20 minutes each uh, with, with different water resources professionals. And you get to know a little bit about uh, their, their career journey, how they got to where they are, advice they have, and, and get to know them personally too. Uh, we also have these recorded as, as, uh, as audio files. So if you're so inclined to listen to them as a podcast, uh, you can, you can, you can uh, consume it that way as well. Uh, again, the, these are these are online. They're available, and we're looking for we're looking to continue uh, this series. So, if you're interested in participating in one of these interviews, if you'd like to uh, you know, spend 15 minutes and, and tell people about you know, what you do and how you got to where you are, we'd we'd love to interview you. So, please let us know if you would like to be part of the Meet the Professional interview series. Um, it, so I, I mentioned a little bit the challenges uh, that we've had in 2020. Uh, you know, our first goal was to continue our lunch and learn series. We saw that as being really a hallmark of what we've done at, uh, at, with Idaho section of AWRA, and and we've had to make uh, you, know, you know the in-person events aren't aren't happening anymore. So we've made a shift to web-based content through our website and everything I've discussed. Uh, we've also hosted discussions on our web meeting, either informal discussions through our our online happy hours, and then uh, structured discussions. Last month, we had a really good discussion with uh, Idaho Department of Water Resources, 
Water District 63 and Pioneer Irrigation District on water management in the Treasure Valley. We'd like to do more and more of that. Um, it, it, another another uh, you know, benefit that we've had from making that shift to digital content is it's made it a lot easier for us to have uh, participation in the organization statewide. And in today's event will be another great example of that. Um, all of these ultimately help us further AWRA's goals. Um, uh, you know, looking forward, you know, hopefully in the in the coming year, with uh, with the good news of, uh, of a successful vac vaccine, we'll be able to continue in person meetings. When we do that, we're going to want to uh, find ways to continue to engage participants virtually. And if so, if anyone has uh, ideas for how to do that. Uh, you know, it's certainly a goal of ours and something that we want to do moving forward. Uh, so, so if you'd like to get involved with our section, uh, there are a number of ways you can do that. Continue to participate in our in our webinars and our online discussions. Uh, participating, as I discussed, in the Meet the Professional interview series. Um, the uh, and then we're always looking for uh, for more members of our executive board. Um, these, these meetings used to be held over lunchtime at a coffee shop in downtown Boise. Now these are Zoom meetings, so you certainly don't have to be able to make it to uh, make it to downtown Boise over the lunch hour uh, to be on the executive board anymore. So you know, anyone across the state, if you're interested, um, you know, please let us know. You can sit in on those board meetings. You don't have to be an officer to participate in those. However, if you are interested in, in, in becoming an officer and taking a leadership role in the organization, we're actively looking for uh, nominations right now uh, for our president-elect in 2021, uh, our, our vice president in 2021, and our secretary treasurer uh, for the coming year. So if you're interested, or if you know somebody who would be interested, please let us know uh, because this is, a, this is a volunteer organization and uh, our success is dependent on uh, the, the, the contributions of volunteers. And, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our, again, uh, reintroduce, I guess, our, our president uh, for 2021, Kendra Kaiser. Dr. Kaiser is a research assistant professor at Boise State University. She holds a PhD uh, from Duke University in watershed hydrology and biochemistry and a bachelor of science in soil and water science and environmental biology from Montana State University. Uh, she does uh, a, a lot of research in the area of hydrology, water resource management, and modeling, and has been involved in AWRA both uh, with the North Carolina State Chapter when she was at Duke University and will be our president for the coming year. So at, at this time, I'd like to you know, turn the meeting over to Kendra as she will be guiding our round, our round robin discussions and our, uh, and our breakout discussions. Kendra? Thanks, Mike. Um, well, again, I'd just like to say thank you all so much for coming. It's, it's really great to have so many people joining today. We're really excited uh, for all the things that we get to do this upcoming year. So what we're going to do is, if, Mike, if you want to go to the next slide, um, what we're going to do is we're first going to have presentations from Paul Kimmel from the Palouse Basin Aquifer Committee, Rob Van Kirk from the Henry Spork Foundation, Angela Michaels from the Northwest Regional Floodplain Management Association, Brian Patton from the Idaho Water Resources Board, and Wade Allred from the Southern Idaho Water Quality Coalition. And so they're going to be doing pretty short, uh, like five to seven minute uh, presentations on what their organizations do and, you know, interesting things that are going on with them. And we'll have time for maybe like a quick question or two after each of those that you can put in the chat box and, and we'll, we'll ask them. And then right after that, we're actually all going to go out into breakout rooms to have discussions about some of these topics and uh, make introductions, give us a little bit of opportunity to hopefully meet somebody new and, and hear about other research that's going on in, in the area. So what I'm gonna do right now as we're about to get started is we've got a quick poll um, that we just wanted to find out uh, where everyone is coming from as far as uh, what sector you are currently working in. And so that should pop up on your screen and you can just answer 
uh, what sector you're in. And then we had on here uh, asking you which breakout group you'd like to join, which is great for us to find out after the fact. But in order for me to put you in a breakout room, what I need you to do is go into the chat window and put in there which breakout group you'd like to join. So the options are hydropower, water quality, fisheries, water supply, and flood management. And then uh, if we have a big difference uh, in like one breakout room that's maybe a little bit smaller, I might uh, rearrange folks so that we can have enough folks to, to be able to chat uh, after, the, uh, after the different presentations. And once we're in those breakout rooms, we'll have an officer, an AWRA officer in each room, and they'll help facilitate introductions and all the like. So our first uh, presenter is Paul Kimmel. And so actually, Paul, I, I don't think I gave you presentation capabilities yet. So let me do that real quick. Um, and then you can share your screen. All right. So Paul, you are a co-host now. So you can share your screen and get your presentation up. And Paul Kimmel is, a, is the Palouse Regional Business and Public Affairs Manager with the Avista Corporation. He holds a bachelor's degree in geography and urban planning from Illinois State University and did his graduate work at the University of Idaho in the College of Mines. He's also a graduate of the Washington State Ag Forestry Leadership Program. He has held positions across a, a huge array of uh, corporations and organizations, both at the local and state level. And I uh, would share all of those with you, but I know he has to jump off onto a phone, uh, onto a meeting right after this. So let's see, um, you can go ahead and start, Paul. Thank you, Kendra. Can everybody see the slides okay? Yeah, Great. we can see the, the presenter view, but I think that that's all right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, on behalf of Police Space and Aquifer Committee, I currently chair that organization. Um, just quickly, our basin is relatively small. It's, it straddles the Washington-Idaho border up here on the Palouse. Uh, the, most of the basin lies within the state of Washington, but there is a little bit on the Idaho side, as you can see. Again, our entities uh, are the two cities, Moscow and Pullman. There are two counties. Washington State University, University of Idaho, and ex officio members are both Department of Ecology and uh, Idaho Water Resources. Again, history here, um, Pullman was actually founded as an artesian city, um, and some of the early wells actually um, were so productive, and that, that's what determined um, why WSU, the land-grant institution, actually located in Pullman. Um, PBAC was established in 1967, and in 1992, we uh, established our groundwater management plan. Um, again, our functions are collecting data and funding groundwater research within the basin. Uh, we provide community information about water resources um, and working on long-term water supply strategies um, and doing a lot of community engagement and outreach. Uh, just to give you a little snapshot, our 2019 pumping, since that was our um, last full year, uh, 2.35 billion gallons between the respective entities with the two cities, uh, of course, uh, using most of that supply, um, WSU. And there's a little skew here with um, the U of I domestic. The U of I um, irrigation is actually reclaimed water from the city of Moscow wastewater plant. So that doesn't show up in that. Um, we've been on a steady decline since uh, we started measuring back in the 1930s. Uh, and originally that was about a one and a half foot decline annually. Um, since we formed the groundwater management plan, adopted that, we've slowed that decline down to less than a foot. And if we drill even further, we can see it's closer to uh, 0.7 feet of decline a year. Uh, nevertheless, the aquifer is in a state of decline. And this is our Grand Ron aquifer. So we, we essentially pump out of two aquifers. The deep, more productive is the Grand Ron. Uh, the more shallow one is the Wanapum. And uh, Pullman only pumps, and WSU only pumps out of the deep one. Moscow will pump out of both. Um, and again, here's a little shot of the Wanapum long term. Um, you can see it's all over the board. Again, we have good recharge in that. And this slide, you can see where um, 
it does recover. But again, if you pump it too hard, like in the 80s and back in the 60s, um, it was pumped way too hard. Uh, we didn't get recovery. And in um, last year, the city of Moscow decided not to pump out of the shallow. And you can see the, the recovery there, the red line. Um, so we do, we do know we get recharge in that shallow um, system. Again, we track use per entity as well. Um, and to most people, um, let's see, um, you know, we're usually tracking at or below past years. Uh, just kind of depends weather, uh, so forth. But uh, consider that about a 1% less pumping from 2019 to from 2018. And then we track a five-year average as well. And, and we can see that um, all the entities are staying below that um, pumping. Uh, Pullman was up a little bit, but they also had a little more uh, population gain as well. And what that looks like is uh, in spite of a 47% population gain from 1992, uh, there's only been an 8% uh, increase in water consumption. Moscow, similarly, um, lots, of, uh, lots of growth, uh, but even less water consumption. So per capita, uh, we're moving the dial really well. And then as per our groundwater management plan, um, we have a 1% one, 1 cap annually on that or a ceiling of 125% of roughly 3 million gallons. And as you can see across this uh, trend here, um, we've stayed well below that and, and we're really pleased uh, that we can do that. About half of our irrigation or use consumption is in the irrigation season. Um, so we're, we realize that and we really want to focus on conservation programs during that irrigation season because you can see the baseline there of use in mostly indoor, etc. Um, thankfully, we don't have a lot of high water consuming industries on the Palouse, um, so that helps us really maintain that, that trend line. Um, again, summarized 2.3 billion gallons in 2019, a little less than 2018. Um, overall, since 1992, about 14.5% decrease in our water use. And again, that water, Wanapum well does recover. Um, so we're kind of thinking going forward, uh, maybe a change in the pumping plan. Uh, and again, we track that. Um, and just a couple of assumptions going into 2020, once we get the, the year end um, trending down. And again, some of that was COVID related with two university communities, um, less water consumption. We were hoping we could see a little more reduction um, we're estimating it could be up to 120 million gallons. Um, and you can kind of see between the two uh, sides of the border, um, pumping was down this past spring considerably. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and again, some of that weather savings, cold spring, wet spring, COVID related, um, all these things kind of factor into um, how we track that. So interesting for us to do that. Again, 2010 was our lowest year on record for water consumption. Uh, a lot of that was likely a cold spring and a, a wetter summer. Um, and then 2019 could end up being our, um, uh, or 2020 could end up being actually our lowest compared to 2010. So again, good news there. And then we track per entity what that looks like. And you can see this is our 2020 pumping. Um, versus 2019, you can see all of the entities uh, were trending considerably down in their overall consumption. Um, so we're not sure where we're gonna end up. We could be at 2% less, so forth. Um, current projects, we're uh, continuing to do survey work out in the basin with our communities around both water awareness and some of the work that uh, um, our researchers are doing. Um, we did a LEAP analysis and um, are standing up a stakeholder engagement group as we move forward with an additional water supply project. Uh, we've got some university folks doing some water tracing around seismology. Uh, and then we have um, a water supply alternatives project um, that is underway. And Dr. Robin Nimmer, Alta Science and Engineering is uh, the principal leading that effort. And again, we know with the trending decline in the supply, um, we're still gonna have to find more water and what does that look like? So Robin is helping us with that. We've had that study going on now for a few years. Uh, we were funded partially by Idaho Water Resources. Thank you, Brian. Um, 
And so with that, we are now in a final refinement and we hope to really land on uh, a preferred alternative here in the next 18 months or so. And then we're doing some new watery model modeling. Um, we've been working on an old outdated model and there's some pretty cool stuff going on. Uh, so we're working with WSU on a, a new modeling structure. Again, our website, water on the Palouse, palousebasin.org. Um, and with that, thanks again. Thanks, Paul. Uh, and if you can stop sharing, then we'll have Rob Van Kirk is up next. And Rob, you can get your screen up while I introduce you. So Rob is the senior is a senior scientist at the Henry's Fork Foundation in Ashton, Idaho, and professor emeritus of mathematics at Humboldt State University. He earned his bachelor's in mathematics and his master's in environmental systems from Humboldt State and a PhD in mathematics from the University of Utah. He's been active in collaborative fisheries and hydrology research and management in the Intermountain West since 1994, specializing in stream flow provisions for fisheries, groundwater surface water interactions and conjunctive water rights administration. And I will just remind everyone that if you haven't picked a breakout room to join, then I will randomly assign you. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Kendra. Um, so yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to just give a brief um, pitch, I guess, about our organization, which is the Henry's Fork Foundation. We're a nonprofit um, with a fairly simple mission, conserve and protect fisheries of the Henry's Fork watershed over here in eastern Idaho. Um, you know, our, our little soundbite for how we do our work uh, is science-based collaboration. We do that across the entire Upper Snake River Basin for the reason that, uh, you know, water rights and water management are integrated across the entire basin. So things that happen a long way from here um, affect uh, management of the Upper Snake Reservoir system. Um, and we have a couple of those reservoirs in our watershed. So organizationally, uh, our programs, um, I direct the science and technology program. I'll show a little bit more about some examples of what we do there. Uh, we have a new program in farms and fish, we call it. Uh, we have education program. We just started a new initiative on the South Fork Snake River um, to kind of take some of our work uh, and expand it to that, um, that stretch of the Snake River. And then we, we have kind of more traditional um, programs in uh, river protection, stream bank um, protection, access, that sort of stuff. Partners and stakeholders, we work with um, a ver wide variety of management agencies, uh, water fisheries, um, uh, agriculture agencies, river recreation, of course, um, that's our biggest stakeholder group in terms of our, our membership and supporters. We work a lot with other um, non-governmental organizations, with individual irrigation entities, and then in fact, with just you know one-on-one -on -one with agricultural producers here on the ground. And in the center here, I've got communications and outreach as kind of the glue that holds this whole thing together. Um, so I just want to give you a, some a few concrete examples of some projects we've been involved in and our role in the in the uh, project. So one of them is. Uh, restoration of traditional flood irrigation in, in Teton Valley. Um, and the goals here were to increase base flow and groundwater levels for, you know, for all stakeholders, uh, ranging from the agricultural producers to uh, cities that get their uh, drinking water out of the local aquifer there. The um, project leader uh, on this is Friends of the Teton River. It's one of our sister NGOs, as well as um, local canal companies and some individual agricultural producers. Funding for this project uh, comes from kind of our usual mix of funding, private donations, um, federal grants. Of course, those require non-federal match, and so we've got some other grants to match those. Um, in, in the scientific and technical support on this, we do have uh, I've hired a consultant to do some of the monitoring um, of surface water um, and groundwater levels in the valley, but it, our organization is doing most of the monitoring and, the, and then of course all the um, hydrologic modeling to support the project and analysis of, of data. 
So another, um, this one's kind of fun because it, it's actually related to recreation management, which isn't necessarily a lot of resource management, except in this case, it, it's um, working on something called the Big Springs Water Trail. Those of you who've been over here know that um, that's a very popular um, kind of flat water float down the Upper Henry's Fork. And the, it's managed by the US Forest Service and they really needed some um, data on recreational use and um, use of their facilities to inform management there. The, the place is incredibly heavily used and they had some management decisions to make about a, a concession permit, didn't have the resources to get the, uh, you know, the data they needed. So we stepped in, we're able to um, quickly get enough private donations to support the work. And we did a full user assessment to give you some idea, 37,000 user days uh, <laughs> is the use on this. It's like a four mile section of river. Um, it's a pretty small river, we're talking like 300 cubic feet per second typical flow. So um, anyway, we, we did a use estimate. estimate. We um, also estimated use of facilities such as parking lots and restrooms and that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, did a survey of user experience, did all the analysis, packaged all this up and got it to the Forest Service. Um, we did the whole start to finish um, in probably nine, 10 months, got them the information they needed in time to make a management decision. So this is the kind of, um, you know, technical and um, kind of scientific work that we do. And it's, the, I, I like this one because it's not just the usual water management sort of stuff that, that I do mostly. Um, and then this one is though, we um, partnered with Fremont Madison Irrigation District on what we call precision irrigation. Um, project there. The goals here were to improve water delivery for um, water users, reduce cost um, to the canal companies and individual irrigators, and reduce reservoir draft. And the funding, this was a Bureau of Reclamation Water Smart grant that went to Fremont Madison Irrigation District. And then we actually supplied most of the non-federal match. Uh, we had a local engineer works on irrigation infrastructure actually install some remote controlled head gates at certain points on the on the system. Um, most of those points are administered or, or um, actually implemented by the individual irrigation entities, some by Fremont Madison Irrigation District. We did all the scientific and technical support. So we installed a half a dozen um, real-time stream flow measurement stations like this one that uh, one of my staff members working on here. And then uh, got got the data transmission set up so the water managers, the irrigation district, and the canal companies have data in real time uh, to work with all summer. And then, of course, we did all the you know hydrologic modeling to support this and the analysis. Um, and, it, and it was a huge success. This was our first year. We just got the you know, the project started last winter and we were able to just barely get all the infrastructure in before they needed it in the irrigation season. But um, the at the end of the irrigation season, we figured, you know, this, this project probably saved about 4,000 acre feet uh, of water in Island Park Reservoir. Island Park's about 135,000 acre foot reservoir. It's a small um, reservoir compared, like, compared to Boise standards. Um, and Typical draft is about half that in an irrigation season, maybe 60, 70,000 acre feet. So saving 4,000 acre feet out of that um, made a difference. That saved money for the irrigators and uh, gave us a little more water for, for fisheries. Um, and this is an example of some of the real-time data. We actually have this website, it's up public. This is our water quality data website. And then we just got a, another, a different um, water smart grant from Reclamation to develop a companion website that will have real-time hydrologic data on it. And that'll be, um, we're working on that. That's a three-year project. So a few years from now, we'll have another one of these companion sites with um, hydrologic data on it. And there's my contact info. If you want to check out our water quality data site, all you got to do is just henrysfork.org is our website. And then there's a link on the front of that main page to the, uh, the water quality data. So that's quick um, introduction to our organization. I will stop share and um, Thanks, Rob. Can I just 
I just added henrysfork.org in the chat window, and I'm also going to add in a link that I forgot to mention earlier. We just sent out an announcement, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, that the DEQ is looking for water quality data, and the link that I just put in the chat window is uh, where you can go to look at information on how you could contribute your water quality data. So if anybody else has any additional data sources, I'm sure the DEQ would be really excited um, to have that. Um, all right, so our next up, we have Angela Michaels from the Northwest Regional Floodplain Management Association. So Angela, you should be able to share your screen now if you have slides that you'd like to share. And Angela is a civil engineer with a bachelor's from Oregon State University. She has over 30 years of experience, including a five-year stint as the county engineer and floodplain manager for Ada County. In that capacity, she was exposed to the regulatory and administrative side of flooding, the National Flood Insurance Program, and as well as the FEMA flood risk map revision process. She divides her time between hydrologic modeling, general civil design work, and teaching as an SME in the floodplain management and emergency management fields. She also likes to spend her spare time mountain biking, fly fishing, and traveling the world, participating on volunteer design teams in developing countries. Thanks, Angela, for coming. All right, great. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. All right, wonderful. All right, so I am the Idaho State Representative for NORFMA. NORFMA is the Northwest Regional Floodplain Management Association. Big mouthful, right? Um, you might be asking, well, what the heck is a floodplain manager? And depending on what field you're in, you may not be familiar with what a floodplain manager is. So floodplain managers in general um, do work to try and help make sure that development is done in a way that minimizes impacts to our floodplains. Uh, we work to help try and reduce flood damage uh, when a development goes in. And we hopefully try and help protect, manage, and restore floodplains. Uh, there is a certification that you can get as a, as a floodplain manager. It's called a certified floodplain manager. You have to pass an exam. Um, it's a four-day course to take the exam. So it's pretty in-depth. Um, a lot of places that hire floodplain managers want that certification. So that's something that is often required. And the people that are typically certified floodplain administra administrators or floodplain managers are people that are engineers, building officials, planners, sometimes elected officials, hydrologists, people with those kinds of backgrounds. So it can be a very mixed group of people that are floodplain managers. So in Idaho, um, I mean, uh, NORFMA covers the entire Northwest. So, so as a floodplain manager in Idaho, it might look very different from somebody who's a floodplain manager in Alaska or in, you know, Idaho or uh, Washington or Oregon, uh, where their climate's very different, <laughs> uh, or maybe they're coastal uh, or they're along a lake or something like that. But in Idaho, um, as a floodplain manager, people typically in the public sector uh, work for counties or cities or flood, or flood districts. Uh, Ada County, I was the former floodplain administrator for Ada County. Why? Because we have the Boise River running through town and through our valley. Um, cities also have floodplain managers as well if they have a, a water uh, a feature that's running through their community or next to a lake or something. Flood district number 10 is a local flood district here in our valley. Um, I consult with them quite a bit and do, and do work for them with permitting and things like that for projects that they want to do. Um, in the private sector, uh, generally people who are floodplain managers are consultants. Uh, they either work with local governments on projects or developers all dealing with floodplain type projects. And so they uh, have expertise in that area. So with NORFMA, Northwest Floodplain Managers Association, uh, it's a nonprofit organization. It's for regional networking and support on issues of environmental quality and economic sustainability and scientific discovery on a watershed basis. So we try and not just look at, here's my little section of river I'm working on, or here's my little portion of this lake. We try and look at things from holistically and we try and encourage other floodplain professionals to look at systems holistically. Uh, we provide a channel for regional communication and cooperation, again, in Alaska, Idaho, 
Oregon, Washington, and, and British Columbia. We actually do have some members from British Columbia. Uh, all in all, NORFMA has about 350 members. Um, they do range all over these states. Uh, what, what our mission is to provide exchange of ideas and information among members. We do have like lunch and learn type things. We have monthly meetings. We have an annual conference. That conference moves around uh, between Oregon and Idaho and Washington uh, so that it can vary. This year we did it, of course, virtually. Um, we really try and uh, support an integration of multidisciplinary programs and interest in floodplain management because a lot of us come from, at it from very different perspectives, right? Um, it can be floodplain management, it can be from emergency management, um, it can be hydrology, um, you know, irrigation. There's lots of different things that we, we all come from. So uh, we try and integrate those things as much as possible when it comes to floodplain management. We pro education, we try and sponsor uh, training like for HECRAS or hydraulics analysis. Um, we have speakers that talk uh, and come and bring information to us as far as the different floodplain functions. And we encourage government involvement in programs that reduce flood damages and try to protect and restore our floodplains. Um, under NORFMA, there's, our, there's a number of committees. There's, um, I'm gonna send you guys a link right now, just so that you have the link for NORFMA. Um, if I can find where the chat box is. There's the chat. Uh, there you go. There's the link for NORFMA. Um, so NORFMA, uh, within that, in Idaho specifically, um, a number of us just kind of on a casual basis, spearheaded by a gentleman named um, uh, Carl Gephardt, uh, uh, we started getting together loosely as a group to discuss floodplain management issues, uh, concerns specifically for our area and for the state. And eventually we got to the point where we met enough and there was enough of us that we decided, hey, we should be a club. <laughs> we should do this. We should do this as a legit thing. And so uh, we, we decided to form this Idaho Technical Committee. We thought, thought about different organizations we could become a part of or do we create our own. But it seemed logical after some, some discussion to be a part of NORFMA. So we opted to become the Idaho Technical Committee of NORFMA. Uh, and our goal as this Idaho Technical Committee is to really do kind of this similarly what NORFMA does, work within Idaho to help promote better floodplain management. And some of it's through, through science, some of it's just education, a lot of it's just communication and being a resource for floodplain managers, managers around the state. Um, as most everybody knows, uh, there's a lot of very rural communities where, where the city clerk is also the dog catcher and the building official, and they might be the floodplain administrator. And they may not even know that until they like show up for the job, right? <laughs> and so this person has no background in this expertise or in this field, and suddenly they're thrust into a position and they're making decisions that are pretty serious decisions. And so we wanna hopefully be a resource for these people that are in that situation. Um, as well as just other people that are doing floodplain modeling, um, people that are doing different uh, uh, river restoration projects. We want to be able to be a resource and we want to have work groups that can put together topics and, and discussion papers and things like that and help address some of the floodplain management challenges that we have in our state specifically. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you know anything about floodplain management in our valley, um, we, we have a number of entities on the Boise River. We have the city of Boise, Garden City, Caldwell, Nampa, Ada County, Canyon County, <laughs> and none of them have floodplain management ordinances that match. They are all different. And, and, and so you could do floodplain management in Garden City and have a very different set of requirements than you would for, say, uh, Ada County Highway District or Caldwell or something. So we'd love to try and at some point maybe get more consistency in that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's pie in the sky, but we'd like to. <laughs> um, and one thing that uh, uh, we have worked with or, or been thankfully been a little bit of a part of is flood district number 10 that's in our valley um, has actually gotten some recent LIDAR data. 
Uh, so if you don't know that, um, know that it's out there. Um, it should be available on the consortium's website. Uh, but yeah, we have some fabulous uh, LIDAR for the Boise River that was flown this last December. And so if you're looking for that kind of information, know that's on the consortium's website. And we're just super excited about having that kind of data because that will help all of us in the Valley who are doing work in the fluid plane management have better data. So that's what I have. If you would like to be a part of our Idaho Technical Committee or NORFMA, you've got the link for NORFMA. Ron Manning is kind of our, our chief uh, person here for Idaho as far as membership. So if you want to talk with Ron, um, chat with him. There's his email address. And I'm just going to check the chat box. Does anybody have any? Oh, yep. Thank you, Kathy, for putting up more information on Northma. Uh, there you have it. I will go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Thanks, Angela. Thanks. That was that was great. And yeah, if, if anybody has questions as we're going along, definitely uh, add them into the chat room and our speakers will all be joining uh, different breakout rooms afterwards as well. So next up, we have Brian Patton from the Idaho Water Resources Board. So Brian, you should be able to share your screen. And Brian is a licensed professional engineer and has been with the Idaho Department of Water Resources since 1995 in various positions of increasing responsibility. He currently serves as the executive officer for the Idaho Water Resource Board. In this role, he has direct responsibility for all programs, projects, and actions carried out by the Water Resource Board, including efforts to resolve the water supply and the band imbalance from the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer, efforts to increase Idaho's water storage capacity, operation of various state water projects, management of the board's financial activities, and revision of the state water plan. He acted as the project manager for several projects undertaken by the board as well. He graduated from the University of Idaho with a degree in civil engineering, and he enjoys time spending time with his family, especially pursuing outdoor and sports activities. So you can go ahead, Brian. All right, uh, good afternoon. Can everybody see my screen just fine? Okay, I'm gonna give just a very, very brief overview of what the Idaho Water Resource Board is and some of the things that uh, we're currently working on. So the Water Resource Board is a state agency. It is uh, sort of part of the department and sort of not really part of the department. So th this is just a little, little uh, brief um, chart here that kind of shows the, uh, the, the, the um, difference in responsibilities between the director of the Department of Water Resources and the Water Resource Board. So the director is appointed by the governor. He has certain uh, professional licensure and experience requirements, he or she um, has certain professional licensure and experience requirements. But the director's job is everything having to do with water rights. The director issues water rights, the director transfers water rights, the director makes sure the right amount of water gets put into each canal, head gate, or well according to those water rights. And then the director has some other regulatory functions including dam safety regulation, uh, well driller oversight, things like that. The Water Resource Board, on the other hand, uh, comprised of eight members around the state. Uh, they are also appointed by the governor with the advice and consent of the Senate. Uh, they are balanced geographically and politically, and they, they also have uh, ex experience requirements in water resources. So the director does not work for the board. The board does not work for the, the director. Uh, they have to figure out how to coexist. The board's role is to plan for Idaho's future water needs and then carry out projects and programs to meet those water needs. And that kind of falls into the bucket of problem solving. And then um, the Department of Water Resources provides staff to, to both of these functions, both the director's role and, and the board's role. So I get to work uh, both directly for the board and for the director. So it's my job to uh, keep both of them going more or less in the same direction and to resolve any disagreements between the two uh, that come about because one does not work for the other. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna touch on maybe one of our biggest, perhaps our biggest initiative that we're currently working on. And I see Rob nodding his head. Uh, I've worked, worked very closely with Rob on, on this as well as a number of other folks. This is a uh, chart of the last 110 years or so of the history of the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer. And the solid black line is uh, showing the, the uh, change in aquifer storage. 
So it went up for 40 years because we built and operated unlined irrigation canals across the plain. And the unlined canals leaked a certain amount of water. That water wasn't lost, it went into the aquifer and provided this additional water supply in the aquifer. Uh, for the last 60 years, it, 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 it's been going down and that, that's of concern for a number of reasons. The vertical bars are actually the, the combined outflow from the Thousand Springs reach of, of the Snake River near the Magic Valley. And you can see the aquifer storage goes up, spring flow goes up, aquifer storage goes down, spring flow goes down. Now the spring flow going down is of concern for a number of reasons. See, we the spring flow dropped from about a peak of about 6,900 CFS in 1951 back down to, in 2015, it was about 4,500 CFS. So that dropped off considerably. Um, this is a map that just kind of shows and, and helps illustrate why that's of concern. So we have the Snake River stretching across the state from Wyoming to Oregon and the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer sitting there underlying a big, huge chunk of it. The aquifer discharges flow through springs to the Snake River at a number of locations, starting all the way up in the Henry's Fork area near St. Anthony. That's of concern to Rob for fisheries uh, reasons, uh, but it's of concern for to for other people for other reasons. And we have uh, discharge in the American Falls reach and then uh, discharge in the Thousand Springs area. And there are a number of water users that have senior priority water rights located downspring of those spring discharge points. So as those spring flows have declined, what we've seen is the, the river flows are, are low and that impacts uh, senior water right holders and they're not getting their full water supply. So we saw a number of canals in the Magic Valley area downstream of American Falls and we saw a number of commercial fish hatcheries in the Thousand Springs area all go to the director and say, hey director, we're not getting our full water supply according to our water rights. Go shut off those groundwater pumpers on the Snake River Plain because they have junior water rights compared to us. Well, okay, so that touched off roughly a two decade legal battle, uh, you know, between groundwater users, these other surface water users and the state. Um, and, you know, we had had some scenarios, you know, the, as, as all good legal battles do, the director made his rulings that got appealed to the courts, so went to the Supreme Court a number of times in a number of different, different venues, got handed back down to the director. Um, we, were, we were dealing with scenarios where, and, and when you, you, you're dealing with scenarios where you have the potential for widespread groundwater pumping curtailment, not just agriculture, but cities, towns, factories, businesses, processing plants, you know, that gets everybody's attention real fast because of the potential impact to the state's economy. In addition, um, as we saw declines in the Thousand Springs area, we rely on those Thousand Springs flows to provide flow down here in the lower part of the Snake River and meet the minimum flow requirements at Swan Falls Dam that were put in place for hydropower generation. That's because much of the river flow is, is uh, depleted and significantly reduced up here in the Magic Valley area for irrigation. So we rely on those Thousand Springs to replenish the river and meet, meet the obligations uh, that the state has established uh, for minimum flows under the Swan Falls Agreement between the state and the Idaho Power Company for, for hydropower generation. So as those spring flows declined, uh, the ability to meet those minimum flows was, was uh, brought into question. And in fact, when we, in 2015, were the first year we did not meet those minimum flows. Okay, so through a number of um, maneuverings, uh, legal maneuverings as well as settlement negotiations. And this, this is, a, I have a whole nother presentation I can give at some point, you know, explaining how all of this came about. But we ended up with this management strategy for the Eastern Snake Plain Aquifer, the centerpieces of which are a 250,000 acre foot annual average recharge program by the state, which is, was given to the Water Resource Board to implement. And the groundwater pumpers or the groundwater irrigators at least, uh, agreed to reduce their consumptive use by 240,000 acre feet. And then there's a number of other components. There's this 50,000 acre foot storage water components. The food processors uh, collectively have agreed to acquire a certain amount of their storage water, provide their storage water for aquifer management. The cities on the Snake River Plain have agreed to provide a certain amount of their storage water for aquifer management. 
Uh, we have actions by the Southwest Irrigation District and A&B Irrigation District, which are big groundwater users that are not part of the 240,000 acre foot reduction. They have their own contributions. And then we've established a uh, actually a large scale cloud seeding program uh, in, in, in the region to provide more water into, into the system. And this kind of follows on the blueprint that was laid out in what we call the Comprehensive Aquifer Management Plan or CAMP that was developed uh, by the board with the help of a stakeholder group oh, about a decade ago and, and approved by the legislature as a part of the state water plan. And this strategy that's been put into place follows very closely on what was laid out in the camp. Um, so, you know, the, 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 the water board's major part in this is the, is the uh, aquifer recharge program. You can see we started this back about 2015. We started a little slow as we built additional infrastructure, got recharge sites up and running. We've been able to actually exceed the legislature's direction to us of that 250,000 acre foot average annual program. And I think that's been a really successful effort on, on the part of the Water Resource Board. So how are we doing? This is that same chart showing the up and the down, but this has the last, last five years appended. You can see we bottomed out here in about 2015 when the aquifer management efforts started in earnest, when the state recharge program began and that the, the the settlement agreement where the groundwater users agreed to reduce their, their consumptive use. And see, since that point, we've added 2.2 million acre feet to aquifer storage in the aquifer. And the Thousand Springs outflow has increased by about 850 CFS. So I think so far we've been successful, although this is a marathon, not a sprint. So, you know, we'll see how successful we are over over the next you know several years as as we get more data points onto this chart but so far the early indications are this this aquifer management strategy is working and again that barely scratches the surface of of this program how it came about and how what all the moving pieces are doing just want to touch on some other uh significant uh initiatives that are currently underway by the water resource board we're working on a project to enlarge the Anderson Ranch Reservoir uh, upstream of Boise. Uh, that's a joint project with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, to provide additional water supplies for the growing Treasure Valley. That would increase the Anderson Ranch Dam by about six feet, provide another 29,000 acre feet of water storage. That is our, and uh, that just was found feasible by the Secretary of Interior earlier this week. So this project really I think can move now. Um, so this is our first real opportunity to increase uh, uh, reservoir capacity in the state in the last 50 years. Um, we have the Priest Lake Water Management Project. That's a project to um, uh, re rework the water management structures at Priest Lake so we can we can manage water in that that system better. That's one of our big northern Idaho lakes. And uh, we, we've actually run into scenarios in the last few years where we didn't have enough water in the system to both keep the lake full and keep the river flowing. Well, there is, but we need, we need to actually store more water in the lake earlier in the season. So we're rebuilding the water ma management facilities there in order to do that. You see the, the, the picture of the guys working in the lake there in the snow, that, that's a picture from last week. So construction of that project is, is underway. Uh, we're working on a project with the Air Force to provide a state sustainable water supply to the Mountain Home Air Force Base. They draw their water from the Mountain Home Aquifer, which is in a state of pretty rapid decline. And in fact, the Air Force's own study says that the aquifer may become, uh, that supply may be untenable about 2036. So we're working on, a, working on a replacement water supply project for the Air Force Base so the water supply is not, not a uh, a factor in any base realignment decisions is the the Air Force Base provides about a billion dollars into Idaho's economy every year. Uh, we're work, currently working on uh, water user settlement negotiations in the Lemhi River Basin due to a number of number of issues that that was we were handed that project by the legislature. One that is relatively new on our radar is the flood flood management grant program. I think the legislature handed that to us about two or three years ago. We've implemented that program and got, got that up and running. I think done some good work through, through that program. 
um, some of the organizations that have been discussed earlier, such as Flood Control District 10 in the Treasure Valley and others have, have uh, received grants through that program. Uh, water project loans, the water board loans funds to canal companies, irrigation districts, groundwater districts, and others for their infrastructure projects. And then we're looking at uh, probably a revision of the state water plan beginning in 2021. That'll probably carry forward for, forward, uh, for a few years after that. With that, that was a very quick and dirty overview. Each of these things I've talked about can be presentation in, you know, in, 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 in their own right. And if, if the you know, AWRA is, is interested in more information on any of these, please let me know. We'd be happy to provide additional presentations at, at uh, you know, lunch meetings or, or whatever you choose. That'll be great, Brian. Thanks for your presentation. Yeah, there's a lot of things that you all are doing and we, we really appreciate all the work that you do. And, and we'll go ahead and, and jump to Wade um, so that we can have a little bit of time for our breakout rooms and we can have follow-up questions there as well and, and see which of all of the projects that the board is doing that, that folks would like to hear about this upcoming year. So Wade Allred is with the Southern Idaho Water Quality Coalition. He is the Environmental Health, Safety, and Sustainability Manager at Cliff Bar. Uh, and he is responsible for the environmental compliance and sustainability efforts of the Cliff Bar Bakery. He has worked on the environmental footprint and helped it achieve a 93% plus diversion rate of all waste from landfills along the consecutive pollution prevention awards from IDEQ. Uh, he is a lifelong resident of Twin Falls, except for his time in the U.S. Navy. He was a he's a graduate of Duke University with a in the Master of Environmental Management program, which uh, his project focused on naturally cleaning the waters of the Snake River. So with that, we'll pass it over to you, Wade. Well, thank you very much. It's nice to talk to another Duke alumni. Um, just want to say thanks for having me here, and uh, it's always hard to figure out what exactly to speak about when you're invited to, to speak to a group like this, so hopefully I hit the mark on what you guys are wanting to talk about. So what we do with uh, in the Water Quality Coalition, uh, also known as SWIC, is our goal is to work on improving uh, water quality uh, the Snake River through projects and education. You know, agriculture, dairy, manufacturing, municipalities, people, uh, we've all had our part in damaging the river for the last, you know, 100 years. Nobody's debating that. Um, on the flip side, other people would ask that less invasive uh, farming, dairy practices, manufacturing places take place in the Magic Valley. You know, simple math would show less cows, less farms, would mean less nitrogen and phosphorus in the snake. Um, and that's the chief pollutants. But on the flip side, you know, we live in a, on a planet that's adding 80 million people to it every year. And so to think about that, put it in perspective, for in the five minutes I'll be talking, we're gonna add 120 new people uh, to the planet. We're gonna, over this hour and a half meeting, we're gonna add over 2,100. And just like my kids, they're all gonna wanna eat. So what we know is that the practices in Southern Idaho, while we're not perfect, um, we're getting better. And uh, we're definitely better in a lot of places across the world. And so we know the Magic Valley houses some of the most efficient farming and dairy manufacturing operations in the world. So what we're looking at here in this slide is the Crystal Springs reach of the Snake River in uh, 2004. And what you can see there is all the macrophyte or plant growth, all, almost all of that green in there is what the river was like in 2004. Conversely, what we're looking at is that same reach in uh, 2019 and how much less macrophytes, the plants that are in there, how much less we have. And a lot of that is due to the work that the uh, constituents, the, the parts of the Water Quality Coalition, uh, all the projects they've done. So in 2018 is when we were established. And like I said, the uh, specific goal was to address water pollution um, in the Snake River. You know, over a hundred years ago, Milner Dam was put in place. And uh, ever since then, large scale furrow irrigation was introduced. A lot of uh, industry, um, dairy was introduced and it really uh, took the environmental landscape and the quality of the river downhill for a lot of years. But a lot of those same exact uh, groups, you know, that, that were contributing have really worked hard over the last 20, 30 years to turn the river around. And so, like I said, this picture here is the same stretch 15 years later. 
And the thing that um, excites me about SWIC and, and why I wanted to be a part of it was it's not just a, a single group that just has one uh, type of member. But if you look at the, the groups here, there's people from industry, canal companies, farmers, municipalities, businesses, all working together on these problems. So, like I said, we uh, understand that our stretch of the river has our, um, sorry, um, the type of point source pollution has been the biggest problem. And you know, we know that, or not point, non-point source has been the biggest problem. And that's the kind that doesn't come out of the end of a pipe, out of the end of a wastewater treatment plant, municipality, that kind of a thing. But it's farming, agriculture, dairy, all the other stuff is what accounts for a lot of the problems that are out there. Now, point source pollution, I think most of us know that it's covered rigidly by the Clean Water Act and all of that, that 15% is getting worked on. But the 85% that's outside of the auspice of the Clean Water Act um, largely is difficult to address. And because a lot of our constituents are the, the contributors to that, we, we understand that that's important. And just because we're not covered under the Clean Water Act doesn't mean that we have carbon wash to do whatever we want. Uh, we live here, we, we love the area, and we really want to have a magic valley that's magic at the end of this century. And so that's why we're working together to clean it up. Um, the different members, like I said, have been working individually on projects for years. Uh, Twin Falls Canal Co uh, Company, for example, has completed well over 20 projects in the last uh, number of years. And the Idaho Dairymen's Association has supported a myriad of research projects for crop and uh, waste management techniques that have made great strides towards supporting uh, water quality. But in reality, those are individual achievements. That's this water uh, company or uh, this canal company, that canal company. And what we felt like is that's great, but if we got together, we built this group, then we can come together and we can get a lot more done. And so in 2018, like I said, is when we came together and uh, we started with a couple of water smart grants. And uh, what you're seeing here on the left is uh, the beginnings of, of that, our very first project together. And uh, these projects are um, three pond systems and it's gonna remove sediment from agricultural and rural wet uh, weather runoff. And so when these are all completed, um, they're gonna be able to remove about 2,400 pounds of phosphorus and uh, 1,150 tons of sediment a year. Um, and that's just across these seven and a half acres of ponds that most of them, two thirds of them will be done by the end of this month and they'll all be done by about the first of April. And uh, that's our first set of projects. We've got a lot of stuff that we're working on and hopefully doing better stuff in the future. And that's all I got. Thanks, Wade. That is really great to hear about all the things you all are doing. And, and it's great example of the type of thing that AWRA hopes to promote is having uh, organizations like, like SWIC that are uh, promoting conversation across lots of different folks. Uh, so what we're going to do now is I've assigned everybody to a breakout room, either one that you picked or one that I gave you randomly. And we have, I'm going to put in the chat window here, um, a link to a Google Jamboard. It's effectively like a whiteboard for online meetings. And we're going to have those available. So if anybody wants to add ideas and things in your individual meetings, you can do that. They're kind of just a fun way to interact. And uh, we have a couple of questions posed in there for generating ideas for this upcoming year. And, and really, we're just hoping for it to be a good opportunity to meet a couple of new people and, and hear from other folks about the type of work that we're, we're working on this year. So we've got about 20 minutes and uh, we will, after the meeting's over, the officers are gonna get together and kind of summarize some of the things that we come up with in our breakout rooms and, and we'll be sure to send that out to everyone afterwards. Uh, so once again, just thank you to all of the presenters for giving us a little insight into what your organizations do. And uh, we are looking forward to chatting some more.